Um, so I'm Alex, and uh, I'm going to talk about my favorite house for a little bit. Um, actually, before we begin, uh, does everybody know which house this is? Is there anyone who doesn't know what house this is? Awesome. OK. So if you go to Saginaw, um, and if you go to St. Mary's Hospital, across the street is uh, the last of the Lumber Baron homes that are on the riverfront. Um, this one has, it has a lot of things going on with it and the history of this place. You can really, um, I've got an old house that I live in, but this house, you, 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 you just kind of pull a thread on the history and it just keeps unraveling and unraveling. So there's a lot of stuff to get into. Um, and first things first, uh, I wanted to introduce myself because um, <laughs> I have been, in a very strange love-hate relationship with Saginaw for my whole life. Because growing up in Saginaw, there's, um, there was a theme of everybody ought to leave. Like, you, you, you got to get out of here. That's the priority. Um, so I grew up thinking, you know, well, why care about anything around here when you can just you can go somewhere else, you know? And so the, the intention is to leave. But what they don't tell you when you're growing up is that the problem that Saginaw faces um, and the kinds of things that make people want to leave a town like Saginaw. It can basically be summed up in what I call uh, the Rust Belt uh, Mad Lib, which is um, in the 1800s, in certain Midwestern city, was home to an abundance of natural resource. But by the 20th century, the natural resource was depleted, but was soon eclipsed by the industry that came in. And after the Second World War, the industry began outsourcing, and jobs were greatly diminished, resulting in population loss, and then high rates of vacancy, and then crime. So you can, you can assign this story to pretty much any major city in the Rust Belt. They all experienced the exact same thing. But the thing that was particular about Saginaw was the amount of, um, I call it like a town being on steroids when you have something like General Motors, where they're, uh, they're employing at the peak here 26,000 people. And this peak was also the population peak. There's about 100,000 people in Saginaw. So about one in every four people living in Saginaw worked for General Motors. And when you reduce that down to less than 5,000 jobs, suddenly you, you have a very interesting situation because this is one generation that this happens, that there's this massive, massive disinvestment. So because of that disinvestment, you look around your town and you say, I got to get out of here. So I moved to Chicago. And when I moved to Chicago, uh, I realized that the problem wasn't the city. <laughs> um, there, there was a lot of things that I, I learned in Chicago, namely um, just how to, ah, oh man, how to have everything go wrong. Uh, there was just all kinds of stuff that happened that just made me think, well, why did I leave here? So I left uh, Chicago and I said, well, I'll go to Denver. That's like, it's further away, it's not in the Rust Belt, we'll see what happens there. And then the further I got away, the more I started looking back and thinking about how much I missed Michigan. Um, and there would be these moments where it would be like at a bar or something like that. And someone would say something like, oh, the tigers suck, or something like that. <laughs> and I would, I would have this instinct of like, I have to say something. And it, it, would be, it would be basically like the, you, you can't pick on my brother, but I'm allowed to say whatever I want kind of situation. So that curiosity really led to uh, this whole project, Re Saginaw. Um, I wanted to try to understand the town that I grew up in. And so I started interviewing people because uh, I'm a videographer. I got it from my dad, which I actually heard a lot of people here know my dad. Um, <laughs> The, the process of doing a documentary, I think, is the most fantastic thing. Because your job as the producer is to shut up and listen, and to absorb what people are saying, and then thinking of the next question to keep the other person talking. And so you have a position to just learn like as much as possible by just sitting there and asking questions and being curious and being curious and they introduce you to people. So I interviewed over 60 people for this thing and then eventually said I got to do something about it because I've got 60 interviews here. What is this for? Put it together, premiered it in 2017. It, we had a sold out crowd. It was a great show and then I realized I did not have, like I wasn't articulating the message that I, that I was trying to articulate but I couldn't quite place what that message was. Um, but there was a bunch of stuff going on. So one of the things that came to my attention was that these buildings were being threatened with demolition. Um, and then another thing happened where the rear wall of this building just fell into the, in the parking lot of TV5. 
And then another thing that happened was that it randomly came up at city council. Uh, we ought to do something about this house. It's uh, 2016 when I moved back. And the way that this conversation came up, I think in April, um, I mean, this had been an ownership uh, from the city of Saginaw since 2011. And one of the council members was driving by and said, this looks terrible. We got to do something about this. So they voted to tear the house down. Um, but then there was a big pushback where a lot of people were against that decision. And so they said, OK, we'll halt it. But there was a valuable lesson in this. And this has proven to be very true in everything that I care about in preservation. It always happens in threes. Um, that is actually, uh, that's an expression that's, or that's usually a, um, about how like if a celebrity passes away, there's usually two other celebrities that go with them. With preservation, it's always three things happen at the same time, and it's a deluge. And it's always springtime, because the freeze-thaw cycle happens, and then you have bricks falling off of old buildings and things like that. And that's exactly what happened with this building. This, and if you can't see it, that's the problem. This is, um, this uh, falls onto the sidewalk, um, and the land bank was in the process of acquiring this building. Um, and then the question came up, well, what do we do with this? Because, you know, it's falling into the street, and uh, who knows what shape it's in. And so we decided, well, what if we made a video about it? And so I did a video called Brick by Brick, and, and I interviewed my friends. And one of the main things we wanted to get across here was that the decision that was currently on the table was either repair it for $150,000, and that's being generous, um, or tear down half the block for $324,000. Um, and this was, uh, the bricks came off of the building on the left, but this building was in question now too. They figure, well, you know, we, we may as well just, while we're doing that. Um, so with, with that, that, propul or that kind of question there of do we tear it down or do we put the money into it? That's become the key component to everything that I work on. Because if you look at this, we have money to do stuff. We have the money. But what direction we spend that money in? And, and a lot of people see it as, well, if you put the money in, you're just going to tear the building down later. Or this is an investment. That, that now the building is more ripe for you know, actually being developed and it's being uh, properly maintained. And then a developer said, I'll give you $100,000. I'll pay for it if you don't tear the building down. So with that being you know, kind of a, a no-brainer, of course you tear the buildings down. So those buildings were just gone one day. And all of that advocacy that we did really went nowhere. And we learned a lot from what happened on this block. And there's kind of, there's kind of a funny thing that happened that I'm going to bring up later here, that um, the timing of when this building came down was very strange. Uh, but then you have this situation. Well, how did this play out? The rear wall is gone. That seems pretty terrifying. And this was owned, well, uh, this was privately owned, and the guy who owned it just walked and said, not my problem. And so the city had to do something. They had to make up their mind. And it was going to be like $225,000 or something like that to shore it up. And that's what they did. They shored it up. They put the investment into the building and then handed it off to a, uh, uh, to a developer. And one of the main things, there were two things that made this um, the correct, uh, or the way that they wanted to go with it was informed uh, from the fact that this is one of the last remaining blocks in all of downtown Saginaw that has all of its buildings for a whole block. It's very, very rare. And in fact, this intersection is the only intersection in the entire city of Saginaw that has all four buildings on the corners. So with that state of things, if you, like, if you punch a hole in this building, because it's right here, if you punch a hole into that block, um, not only do you have to shore up the buildings around it, but also you've got that gaping hole now in the block, the historic integrity and all of that, but really the financials is what made sense because it costs more money to shore up the other buildings. So that brings us to this house, which um, this house has already had a lot of advocacy going for it. In 2011, right after it was acquired by the city, um, there was a group of people um, who they were doing everything in their power, including you know, having a petition um, to try to, to lobby the city to say, you know, there's maybe something we could do with this house. Maybe it doesn't need to be torn down. There was immediate fear that it was going to get torn down. Um, and the woman who lived there, um, she was in hospice in New Jersey when this was happening. And this is around 2012. And um, right when they uh, took the petition to council, that's when Rosemary passed away. And it was a very, 
uh, dramatic ending because it then, it, it then kind of changed the favor of the conversation where it seemed like something could happen and then shortly after those efforts began to stall out. And I have to commend Natalie Davis and Tom Mudd. Um, the two of them kept this conversation going and these types of things are, it, it is a relay race in preservation work. You are constantly passing the baton or receiving the baton. And it's, when you have a building that's 150 years old, how many generations of people is that? You know, taking stewardship. And even if it's just advocating for the place, even if it's not your house, you can advocate for these types of places. And really the main reason why that this, uh, uh, that this particular house mattered so much was because of this woman, Rosemary de Gesero. Um, she was, one of the people that everyone in town seemed to know. Um, and I talked to the people at City Hall, and they remember her uh, very well. And I hear this story all the time. She had a pet leopard that she would walk down the sidewalk. So everyone knew who she was. And so it, this was like clockwork, though, because people at City Hall told me that at, at a certain time, around 1230, they would rush you know, to the window and look, and she'd go by walking the leopard. So what a sight. And then we also found these other pictures, too, of the leopard. And I was told that, or actually in the newspaper, uh, they quoted quoted Rosemary saying that he, that he was better behaved, his name is Chichu, uh, that he was better behaved than most dogs. And I kind of believe it with these pictures. Um, and, and also the evidence around the house, which we'll get to in a little bit here too. Um, but she was a preservationist, and this was one of her big fights. Uh, this house is called the Weber Mansion. Um, and if you know the name Hoyt, uh, Jesse Hoyt, who was very instrumental, um, I mean, extremely, like he, like he was the first money into the east side of Saginaw, which they drained a swamp and then they turned it into this, this absolute, like, you know, metropolis, essentially. This was the lawyer of Jesse Hoyt, <laughs> so he made good money. Um, then it moves on, and, and around the Great Depression, I believe, it, uh, it it changes hands and it goes into the school board's ownership and they decided that this house was too small, that they needed more space. So they you know, had a very contentious fight, but um, like Rosemary and her husband Roy went as far as to sue the, sue board, or the uh, school board over um, what ended up happening here because they just raised the whole house and then they built uh, the current Board of Education building, um, which is there now. And this, uh, what, what kills me about this is I bought a house that if this house was still there, it'd be out my, like, it would be out my window. I could, I'd be able to see this. So it kills me all the time. With, I mean, every time I see this, I just think to myself, oh, we got robbed. <laughs> but her dad was this guy, Dr. Michael Ryan. Um, he had what I think might be the most interesting life of, of anyone who lived in this house, mainly because of that time frame he lived in. Um, really, 1860s was when things started to explode in Saginaw. It was right around the time of the Civil War that um, I believe uh, uh, that one of the things I was told by Tom Trombley over at the Castle Museum um, was that or if you were a soldier who left at the beginning of the Civil War and you leave Saginaw and you came back to Saginaw at the end of the Civil War, the town would have doubled in size in the time you were gone. So this town is just exploding. And he was one of the last of the horse and buggy doctors that would go around to the lumber camps and he would sell insurance certificates. And this was very ahead of its time. Insurance was not really, um, it was not nearly as much of a thing as it is now for us. Um, but he was one of the first resident physicians at St. Mary's Hospital. And St. Mary's Hospital, um, there, there was a bit of a problem in 1893 when the entire town caught on fire. Um, one of the things that uh, that was happening was the hospital was engulfed in flames. And now Dr. Ryan was a part of what they called the bucket brigades, which is where they would pass you know, the buckets of water up because you can't just you know, spray a hose from a fire hydrant at this point. You have to pass buckets. <laughs> and it's in the middle, or it's in the middle of a neighborhood basically. Um, the tragic part is this piece of St. Mary's Hospital with how time changes uh, with what, what kind of happens over time with these types of buildings where they morph and they do additions and, and uh, they lose things. That original part would have been right where that smokestack is. And they, uh, they connected the new, newer version in the 20s and then in the 60s they tore down the 1890s building um, 
and then they built a whole bunch of other things. But the campus of this hospital has changed wildly, but um, I find it crazy that Dr. Michael Ryan helped to put out the fire, and then one day, you know, well, it's just an old building. So, and, and the way we fight for uh, certain things at some times, then we don't at other times. But he actually had a doctor's office, um, and he was also the county coroner at one point. He was the head of, of the health department in Saginaw, um, and he had a doctor's office in the basement at the house. Um, and we found this in the basement during a cleanup. Um, and I always ask people, if you recognize this person, let me know. We want to, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to find them. Uh, we have their chest scans and it doesn't look good. But, um, so this is around the time that the ownership changed over to Dr. Ryan, because we're kind of working backwards in time. Um, he was, uh, so he was the father of Rosemary. But this one house was in the family for almost 100 years because uh, when it wasn't Dr. Ryan, uh, like when he passed away, that's when Rosemary and her husband moved in. Um, the doctor's office, they converted into a law office. And what happened uh, before that, though, and again, we're kind of working backwards, this is right around the time that Dr. Ryan would have bought the house. This is the earliest view that we have of the house, and it's because of a car factory uh, that ended up taking over an old planing mill that was owned by a guy named Charles Lee. And so they were uh, creating these cars at the intersection right, uh, basically kitty corner from here, where they would make these cars and then they, they, had, they, they wanted promotional pictures, so they'd you know, take them to the corner and they'd snap a picture. And then this is the other one that we have of them doing a burnout in the snow. Um, but you can see the house, and this is actually how, uh, this is the best thing we have for what we have on the side porch. That's no longer there, and we didn't know what it looked like. And this is the best view that we have of, well, what did it look like? And we have just enough to work off of here uh, where we can actually do something pretty cool. So that brings us to Charles Lee, actually. He was the original owner of the house. Um, he was a lumber baron who had uh, a lot of holdings in the area. And it actually says up here, uh, he was making 28,000 feet of lumber a day. And he was making around 3 million a year, I believe. Um, but he's still kind of a mid-tier manufacturer. He's not at the Wellington Burt or like uh, the Wix level or, or Hoyt or any of those names. Um, he was in the mid-tier and he lived a modest um, and humble life, but he had a beautiful home too. And so the planing mill right here, you can actually see that the house is right here on the corner. And so literally all of the lumber in the house um, or all the woodwork on all of those things came from across the street from his own mill. So they pretty much just carried that stuff out of the shop into the construction of that site. And so Charles Lee, uh, this is a picture that we got from the family actually, which blew my mind because we didn't get this until about three years into the project, I think. And so I spent all this time working on this guy's house and I had no idea what he looked like until this. Um, but he came uh, to Michigan and um, he and his brother got into business um, where they were, uh, they had done a wind-powered sawmill uh, in what is now Gross Point, and then they actually decided um, they were going to buy some land up in Saginaw, um, and so they came up here, and this was at the beginning of the lumber boom, so basically in the early 1860s, he comes up. Um, but then it grows into this entire industry, and uh, it was very unusual that the actual lumber baron who was the head of all of this stuff, would live amongst everything like this. Because these mills are very smelly, and they, they have this very annoying thing that happens where they burn down very easily. And that actually happened multiple times on this block. So this is from the 1870s, and this is a picture from uh, uh, the uh, Goodridge brothers, which if you know them, they are pretty much uh, the photographers of the early days of Saginaw. Um, and they took a lot of incredible pictures. And this is one of them. This is the aftermath of when the mill went up in smoke. Um, what happened later, though, is in 1887, a guy was walking by the newly constructed mill. They had you know, completely rebuilt. Um, and there was a guy walking by with a cigar, flicked an ash onto a pile of sawdust. Two city blocks gone from that. And so when that happened, Charles Lee had to rebuild his house for the third time and his entire business. And all of these things, I believe he was uninsured too, was one of the things that we found. So, and it was millions of dollars just lost overnight to a fire. And he just rebuilds. Um, 
he was also the proprietor of this incredible building called the Academy of Music. Um, this also burned down. Uh, the, the, there was just a lot of, um, a lot of t I'm, I'm so paranoid about fires at the house because I'm just thinking to myself, everything that the guy touched burned down. <laughs> so I'm a little worried about this one. But that brings us back to, um, to the, essentially, um, when I moved home around 2016, um, all of that history that had happened was coming to a head with, uh, well, now we got to say goodbye to this house. And I had just met the thing, you know, like, like I was just starting to fall in love with it. Um, and because of the way that the community pushed back, they said, all right, we'll put it on hold until October. Um, and then October passed, and then uh, March passed, and things started getting a little nerve wracking that they hadn't done anything about it. And one of the things that we did in September was, what happens if we, if we have a bunch of volunteers show up? And we'll, we'll clean up the yard, you know, we'll get rid of the debris, we'll make it look nicer. Um, and that's when we learned a very, very valuable lesson, which is lesson number two. Blight removal can be very fun, because you can just call a bunch of your friends and say, hey, we're going to clean up this uh, yard if you want to come. And so 30 people showed up to help us with this. And I made a video about this, which is online. Um, because this is one of the things I captured for my documentary. Because I was looking for the good things that were happening in the city, and I'm like, well, look, look, look how many people care about this place. And like, how often do you see this kind of thing where 30 people show up to a house that none of them own? It's owned by the city of Saginaw, so technically everybody owned it. But what they did was they took a house that looked like this, and now it looks, it looks better. You know? It's not great, but it's better. And that's the thing that was important here, better. <laughs> just, just improving it a little bit. And if we own this, well, you know, by God, that's embarrassing. That, that's, that's how we treat the things that we own in public ownership. So this gave it, you know, kind of a new perspective. Um, but then when we were doing research, we found this old listing, which is around the time that Dr. Ryan bought the home. Um, so the Lee family moved out around um, 1909. And so it was around 1912, 1913 that Dr. Ryan bought the house. But we found this listing in the paper for the house, and there was this very curious part at the very end where it said, owing to the death of the owner, we are authorized to sell this beautiful home at a sacrifice and easy terms if desired. And we're sitting here thinking to ourselves, that would be great <laughs> if, we could, if we could get rid of this thing at a sacrifice with easy terms. And so like, that became kind of uh, you know, the, the uh, slogan for the whole thing was just like, yeah, well, let's get the easy terms. And what we found out, the reason why the realtor who took over, because when they said we're, gonna, we're not going to tear it down, they let a realtor run with it. And he couldn't find anybody to buy the house. And the reason that was, was because there's a development agreement in place that complicated everything. And these are not easy terms by any means for your average person. Within six months, new roof, you got to fix the chimney and do all the tuck pointing on the house. You got to replace and restore all of the windows. You got to paint where needed, remove the front porch enclosure, improve the grounds. Just go ahead and jump in. And then you can have the house for $25,000. So we were just looking at this like, well, that's tough. Um, is there anything we can do about that? But the, but the problem with this is it's on a main highway. That's why there's a time frame on it. It is on a main highway, and we needed to, we needed to make this happen fast. And I've got friends um, who have done an amazing restoration. And uh, this is the Wolfarth house, and my friends Kevin and Bill did an amazing job restoring this. And I was house-sitting for them, and I was sitting there thinking, I feel lucky that these guys are my friends, because I get to just hang out in this house. And then I thought to myself, well, what if, if, if the Lee can't be someone's house? What if it was everybody's house? And like, what if we found a way to give this kind of a public arm to it? And so this idea came up. And with, when usually with ideas, they kind of spill together, and then the ideas build on themselves. But I thought to myself, well, the dining room could be converted into some kind of meeting space. And uh, you could have like a visitor center or like some kind of shop on the first floor and like a community meeting space. Um, and then we can convert the bedrooms uh, to offices. And uh, we could actually use the basement, too, because if it was a doctor's office, I'm sure we could come up with something good for it. And then you can, you can have people on the front porch, too. It can be open to the public. And we can make this thing into um, a very positive thing in Saginaw. And so we started getting loud about that idea, and we made the news, and we had an idea for an event we called Light Up the Lee, where uh, we said, we're going to put Christmas lights on the house, and we're going to bring a generator, and we're going to fire it up, and we're going to have hot chocolate. It's going to be fun. And it was, but the generator didn't work. And uh, we sat there pulling on it while the news was sitting there like, is it going to light up soon? And 
yeah, maybe, and then it just never did. But that has turned into an annual event. We actually had it last December. Um, where we, we light up the whole house. And so this, this event where uh, we couldn't get the generator to work, well, the next year we plugged into the house. And that was a lot of fun because you don't have to worry about you know, pulling on anything. <laughs> it's just, it just worked. And so there's this tiny little tree too that I put in the window every year and we just kind of prop it up because it's a Charlie Brown tree that just, it, it's an absolute mess. But from this, we learned another lesson, which is the community support does matter. And you have to be able to ask for help on things because when we just said we're gonna clean up the yard, that's how you got 30 people to show up. We asked and, and then people showed up. But people have different opinions. These are two different uh, comments I saw next to each other. Um, tear it down and how great, hope it can be saved. And those were the two perspectives. There's really nothing in the middle. It's either, yeah, get rid of that eyesore. Um, or that'd be great if something happened. So I started advocating. I started working with Floyd Clock, who was the mayor pro tem at the time. I didn't know anything about architecture, so I rented all these books. Uh, and, and I started reading because I got tired of saying the pointy thing, you know, when it should be, you know, it, it, it's a gable. Uh, dormer is another word that I didn't know that I was trying to, you know, the little, little house looking thing up top. Um, it's nice to know the vernacular. And so I started learning that stuff. And uh, Floyd Clock helped me out by just coordinating meeting after meeting after meeting. And he then coordinated a meeting where we went to City Hall and I pitched the idea and they said, we like the idea, but like, do you have any money? And I said, well, no, but th this, this, what, what, if we, what if we tried to figure that part out? So they said, we'll give you three months. We won't tear the house down for three more months, but if you, but if, but if you don't find anything, we, I don't want to see anybody protesting um, when we tear the house down. And I said, all right, that's a deal. And so they gave me three months. And uh, I, I learned every way that you can hear the word no in those three months. Um, and I felt crazy at a certain point because I was just ranting at people about this house. Like, look what we, you know, this, be, this would be cool. And there were just people like, what do you want me to do about that? Uh, I don't know, <laughs> but I'm trying to figure that out. And so at a certain point around the third month, it starts getting weird uh, and it starts getting kind of dark. And I realized like, I don't think this is gonna work. Like, uh, like, I don't know if this is gonna happen. And so I went and visited the house um, and it used to be that your entrance into the house, <laughs> vacant house, was this uh, broken out part of a window uh, where you can just climb in. And so I did one day and I walked around the house and just kind of looked around at everything and it just kind of felt like I was, you know, I was saying goodbye to the place. And it was really sad um, because it's bad, but it's not horrible, you know? like. It, you do restoration work, you realize the bones are solid on this guy. But I grabbed a couple scraps of wallpaper and those are my souvenirs just in case, um, you know, it came down. And then um, shortly after that, a tree fell on the house. Um, and we were just thinking to ourselves, oh God, that's when they're gonna see this place and they're gonna say, now there's trees falling on it. We've let this go. Like, all right, we're done, we're done. So we, we went by one day um, whoop, and we just, uh, cut the tree off the house. <laughs> um, and what tree? You know, I don't know, but, but I didn't hear about anything, anything about a tree. But the, the, the miracle of all of this is that if you look at where it landed, the only damage it caused in the entire, in this entire thing was that right here was a light bulb that was broken. That was it. No damage to the house otherwise. So when we cut that off, it was just, it missed everything important. And so at this point, we're in the third month and it's feeling dark. And then Floyd says, well, there's, you know, there's a developer in Old Town right now. His name's Alex DePerry. And uh, I think you should talk to him. And I call Alex and it's the third week of the third month. And I said, hey, here's my idea. You know, I'm pretty worn out on the pitch at this point. And he goes, huh, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. It was a five minute conversation. And then he was like, let's go to the house and let's check it out. And this is where I really liked the guy, actually, was because we go to the front porch, which is completely caved in, and he traverses around to the side uh, to see what's going on with everything. And I said, hey, Alex, I saw this picture, and there's columns under that thing, I think. I don't know. And he goes, does anybody have a crowbar? And so he grabs a crowbar and just starts bashing at this thing. And then, sure as heck, there's, there's the columns. And then we pulled down the rest of it, and we said, well, the pairs and everything, you know, like, like that, that's a match. And the cool thing too is that the ghosting, uh, if you look actually, the bottoms of these have a little detail on the bottom. 
all of those little details are gone, but they left like a little ghost mark. So we know where stuff's supposed to go. So we had you know, enough to work with. And so um, I went to City Hall with, with Alex this time. And we had a development agreement in place. And it just kind of worked out. Uh, and then the next thing you know, we have keys to the house. And then the next thing you know, we have some architects who volunteer um, to give us the floor plans for the house. And they did it for no charge at all. And so what goes from this uh, you know, pictures from the floor, suddenly when you start looking at it like this, it's like, oh, this is real. <laughs> like, this is an actual project now where we're, we, we can actually see what we can do here. Um, which brought us to another lesson. You have, you have to give them something to approve. You can't just say, save the place. You need to have a proposal that says, this is how I want to save it. <laughs> and, and here's where the funding comes from. And so having a proposal and a funding source, all the lights turn green. And the weirdest thing about all of this is that I was convinced that everyone was evil and hated the house and just wanted to tear it down. And then you get into this position where you're like, how often do they just hear plans with no backing at all and it's just an idea? So of course you get a little jaded about it. But they actually went with it this time. And then uh, it's in the news. And uh, they, the proposal goes to city council. It gets passed unanimously. And then I took a bottle of champagne to the house. And I enjoyed that champagne <laughs> at the house. And uh, the next day, uh, this is when everything just kind of started going bonkers, because the news shows up. And then you know, word gets out that we're going to start this thing. And this was one of my favorite parts of the whole process. Um, we gave the house a haircut, where uh, we started cutting the trees down. And then, by God, there's a house under all that. <laughs> and, and that was actually something Alex said the moment that we had the trees cut down and he came to town. He was just like, th 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 there's a house there. Like, that, that's amazing. And so we could actually see from this side now, like, wow, you can really see how beat up it is. But also, like, there it is. And so we got to work. This is one of the very first volunteer days that we had because we figured if all those people showed up on the outside, what happens if you invite them inside? And a lot of stuff got, a lot of stuff gets done. Um, so there were all these cages in the basement. We had to clear them out of the way because there was an electrical panel that we had to replace. And then we got power to the building. And oh, imagine my joy of turning on the lights in that place, which wasn't the lights. It was a shop light that you plug into a wall because the whole house needed to be rewired. But we had light inside and we could see stuff. Now that we could see stuff, we could see piles like this uh, that they left in the basement for us. And so with, um, with an army of volunteers, we cleared that room out. And then uh, this is another crazy thing that happens. Um, the chimney, that's crumbling. One of those things that's on, you know, it's on the development agreement. You've got to fix it. We had the Masons go up, and there was a community event where they raised a couple thousand dollars. They donated the money to us. And so we used that money uh, to rebuild the chimney here. The dormer that I would mentioned, actually, if you look at this, uh, to the left of the bay window on that picture, you can see that dormer there. It was dropped by a couple inches uh, because the support just snapped because of that hole. You can see where the water would just funnel right into this one spot. And it, it can only take so much of that until you know, it snaps. And then these two guys showed up, never even knew their names. They came in, didn't say a word, and just fixed the whole thing. And it was just in an afternoon, one of the biggest problems of the house was, was just fixed. Like, there, there you go. It's all braced up now. Problem solved. All right, what's next? Well, the roof is terrible. And that's, the, that's light you can actually see coming through the roof. And so you know, they rip the whole roof off. Um, and then th what a difference. You know? So suddenly, everything starts getting fixed. And that leads to another thing that I like to say all the time. This is all mud and sticks. If you break down all of these things to their parts, this is really just a bunch of mud and sticks. And that's something that um, it wasn't until there was a contractor who admitted to me that he had no idea what he was doing. Uh, he, he, he was doing structural work on the house. And we were talking one day. And he was like, I don't know why he has me doing this. I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. And I just sat there, and it just hit me. I don't know what I'm doing either. And <laughs> You're a contractor. <laughs> like, what? What? And so that's when I, I actually had the confidence to say, well, maybe, maybe, you know, I can figure this out. And you break some stuff sometimes. Maybe it goes wrong, but you can learn all of this stuff. Um, and but the the progress that takes place. This was the front room. This is one of the front parlors. Um, 
This is after the initial cleanup, and we got rid of a lot of the, uh, the gunky stuff. And then uh, some drywall, and boom, you're, you're, you're in business. Uh, there was a hole in the roof of the front porch, and that hole caused all that damage. So you tear it all out, and that's actually uh, the area that I affectionately uh, refer to as the pit, because there aren't always volunteers that show up on volunteer days, and on those days, you just got to do stuff. But th there was weeks where it was just me in this pit, <laughs> taking boards, throwing them out, and then like throwing them out the window, and then going around, and then picking them up and throwing them into the dumpster. So the pit was kind of the pits uh, in a big way. But um, we, we just kept going on everything, where we, we took the plywood off, and then suddenly this whole area floods with light. And after we replaced all of the joists here, we were able to put down some OSB, and we've, we've got floor to work with now. And then we, well, the, the, like the roof is bad, so you, you tear the whole roof off, and then, well, you need a structure, so you put the structure together. And then you put some OSB down, and then we needed to patch some parts, and so we used some of the siding, or the, uh, uh, the wood paneling that was in one of the rooms, which um, we weren't going to keep. Um, so that wood ended up being used as a patch, and, and th those types of things started happening around the house that just, they just made me laugh. And then we ripped the whole enclosure off the front porch, and it opened up to the original view of the house. This is, this is how the house is uh, you know, supposed to be seen. And that's a before and after of uh, the problems we had, and then you know, everything's pretty much solved. And then there's smaller stuff that has to do with blight, too, where there was a chain link fence on the window, and then when we took the sash out to, uh, to repair it, we noticed it was insanely heavy. And uh, we realized it was plate glass that they had put in there. We we're like, well, why the hell did they do this? Well, there was a leopard that lived here. And so, <laughs> right, we forgot about that. So they probably put the fencing up so they could open the window and the leopard wouldn't jump out and terrorize the neighborhood. Um, and the plate glass, maybe because it jumps up on the glass, and you know, who knows? It could probably break pretty easy. Or they learned that the hard way. You know, maybe they weren't being pro proactive. Maybe they had to replace the glass, and the, you know, they figured that they'd, they'd, they'd kind of beef it up. Uh, but in the basement, uh, the, the, the cage for the leopard was still there. Um, this was uh, the spot that most people who came to volunteer got a little creeped out, I'd say. Um, because you know it's pretty, it's pretty odd. But all of the remnants from when the leopard was in there have just absolutely destroyed, you know, two by fours. Um, a lot of people told us we should keep the cage, but what do you do with this other than uh, like threaten kids with it, you know, if they're being bad? Um, so we took pieces that were important because you can see it's it's just a chain link fence and some two by fours. So I took these types of pieces and and uh, the the components of the cage, uh, and then we cleared that room out. And it turns out there was windows behind there. And uh, we opened those up. And then we got a temporary furnace in so we could actually, uh, we could actually work with, with uh, feeling in our hands. Um, and then more stuff. This is in the basement. This is actually the wall to the left here. There's a wall that goes all the way across. Well, this is the other side of that wall. And it turns out that it was, it was later added. So we, we tore it down. And you clean it up. And then suddenly, you've got a bigger room. And we did that twice. There were two walls, which kind of made up the doctor's office. But we realized that this kind of space would be way more interesting. And so a lot of people asked us, do you really think you're going to lease out the basement? And the basement has eight foot ceilings and all of this natural light. And it kind of feels like a castle. So it has its own, it has its own environment that um, is in the house, but it's, a, it's its own world, it feels like. Um, this corner was in the basement, that organ, uh, actually me and Matt were, uh, we, we wanted to save it, we lifted it, the whole thing disintegrated in our hands. Um, it was so rotted, but that got cleared out. Um, the hardware, this was another fun part, just start polishing stuff up. Um, rust can be fixed. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff too that if, um, uh, if, uh, if you have uh, some old hardware in your house like this that maybe is covered in paint, you can literally throw it in a crock pot with water for a couple hours and it peels off and you just brush it off and you have the original uh, right under there. So there's all those really simple things, but the initial push that we did took the house from this to that. And this is one of my favorite things. Anytime I give this talk, I love going back and forth on this because <laughs> the, the amount of things that change, and this is as the painters were actually priming everything. Um, we're hoping to do color in the spring here. Um, but yeah, it, just all of the elements of blight 
that go away. But it's the same thing, but now suddenly it's just gorgeous. And then, you know, on, on a bright morning with some primer, the thing just pops. And so this was really the inflection point for all of this of, well, now what? Because we've, we've, we've stabilized the house. We did the development agreement part, the complicated part. Um, so now what? And so we found out about a grant that would make everything that, that like I had proposed of what if we made it a public space. Well, it turns out through the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, they have a program called Public Spaces Community Places where they're trying to turn vacant blighted places into community spaces. And so it was a match made in heaven for the concept we had. And they said, we'll give you $25,000 if you raise $25,000. So we raised $36,000, I believe. We got our match for $25,000. And um, that was another huge lesson of, you know, there are so many different ways to find money for this stuff. And the grant world is full of very specific things that you might have a, a niche that you fit into perfectly. And we really found ours. And so the breakdown of how this happened, though, kind of created a model that I find to be pretty interesting, where about 100,000 of this you know, uh, came from our investor up front. And that made it all possible. But then the next part to complete it, we did all of that through grants and donations. And we're still doing things um, like all the time. And everything's just kind of been either through donations or out of our own pockets. And um, we just, you know, we collect all the receipts. And uh, we do that just to torture ourselves and how much money we've spent. Um, but I wanted to recreate that picture. Uh, because the day that we, that we succeeded in, in the crowdfunding campaign was uh, New Year's Eve 2019. And so we got our funding on February uh, 2020, in, in that time frame. And the weirdest thing happened in March, um, <laughs> where the whole world changed. And everything was just kind of upside down from there, because we were trying to create a public space in a pandemic now. And the funding that we had gotten, it was dropped into the account. And now lumber's exploded in cost. Then uh, sheet metal went nuts, quadrupled in price. And so we just started doing stuff that we could do, you know, like things that maybe we can't, uh, maybe we can't do things with groups and volunteers anymore, but we can socially distance and a vacant house is a great place to socially distance. Um, and so we started just working on the spindles. Um, and there was apparently a piano on the second floor and someone wanted it. So what they did was they punched out the railing and all the spindles and replaced it with two by fours. And, um, we needed to, you know, we needed to do something about that. And we went to a place actually here in Bay City, um, Milltown Woodworks. They took the spindle that we had and they replicated it exactly. And it's just like, I mean, seeing this in a, like a more completed state has just been amazing. But we're almost done with the installation of all the spindles. It's just, boy, there's so much to do in a house like this. But this is another one of the rooms. And this is what we call the commons, actually. This was the area that we wanted to be more of the public space. Um, and this is it today. Um, we did, <laughs> if you notice, this is something that, uh, that, that I have to point out. Notice that everything's green. <laughs> notice how it's not green anymore. <laughs> That took months. <laughs> like it was absolutely agonizing. And uh, probably my favorite part of this whole process was uh, one of the doors. Um, well, actually, I'll get to that by explaining what happened here. Because those doors right there, um, this was how we got it. And then we pulled it off. And that's the entrance that you could just kind of jump into on the side there. Um, and then the whole thing got rebuilt. Like the entire thing was rebuilt. But when we painted that black, um, I was being very uh, quick with, um, I wanted to get out of there that day. I was rushing. And I painted the wrong side of the door. Um, so the door that was uh, uh, green, we stripped it completely. And now it's black. <laughs> and so we got to strip, I got to strip it again. And that was just, uh, boy, that was just wonderful. Um, <laughs> So here's another room, and this was the room that I said, I want that to be my office someday. And currently, that's my office. Um, it's come together so nicely. And uh, it's green. Yeah, <laughs> I painted it green. <laughs> uh, apparently, the green didn't torture me that much, where I decided to choose in, in here. Um, so this is another part where, uh, or like more of the public space, uh, 
uh, component of it. This was it when we got it, and this is it today. Um, with furniture and with the paint on the walls and with everything patched up, uh, it's such a difference. And these rooms we actually have available so you can, um, there's these rooms and then there's another one across the hall. Um, and you can rent these for whatever it is that you're doing. We wanted to make this really accessible to where the price point is, if you want to have a meeting for a group you're with or if you want to have a wedding or if you want to do a workshop on something, the rent's 20 bucks on weekdays. And we, we, we just wanted to make this very accessible. So if you wanted to uh, try a small business or something like that, you could have a spot on Washington Avenue for a little bit. And we wanted to really make the house from top to bottom that that kind of entry point because there's um, I'm going to start a business out of my house and then there's I'm going to have a storefront and then there's not much in between and having something that you can kind of put your toe into is what we wanted to make with this space because the, you have these massive rooms and they can be anything so the furniture can move around you can do all kinds of stuff in it um, I also wanted to mention that this front room has this beautiful piece of stained glass in it um, this was actually stolen um, back in 2012 and it came back to us in 2019, I believe. Um, we spent about $2,500, had the thing taken apart piece by piece and restored. Um, and it, it's just, I mean, what it does to the floor even. Um, and that's before we refinished the floors too. So it's even better now. Um, and it just started looking so nice. This was actually a day that Alex said, we need a good picture of the house. And so I turned on every light in the house and then and I went and took a picture. And the funniest thing was there were like three other people who pulled over and stopped to take pictures as well because it hadn't been lit up like this in years. So that was, that was a really fun part. But a couple of the last lessons that I wanted to jump over to, um, preservation work doesn't need to be dramatic. It helps because of these types of things. You know, like, great headline. I can show this in my talks and say, look how close it came, you know? <laughs> but we, we, we learned how to be a little more, uh, uh, not as loud about it. You know, the drama doesn't have to be there. You don't have to be chasing the wrecking ball, which led to the next lesson of identify and protect the important things in your town, even if there's not a threat, because that's the problem that the people in the city had with the preservationists was the moment they say, all right, we're going to tear this building down. Everyone goes, I love that building, not that building. And then it's, well, wh where were you four years ago? You know, like, what, if you love it so much, then, you know, take it. But no one ever does. So it, it then becomes a threat because it's falling into the street and they have to do something. So something like this happens. You know, you, you got to do something. And so you do something about it. And so we could have identified this. In fact, what they did to try to stop the demolition was they, they uh, proposed a historic district on this block. And that was what went to city council as the way that we could potentially stop the demolition because you can't tear down a building that's under study. The council turned it down. They didn't want to step on the county's toes because these are county owned buildings and then you got the city who is trying to enforce code and things like that. It's a very tricky situation to be in. But that also led to something that, um, this is a quote that I actually pulled from my friend Amy Spadafore. Uh, she said that activists might not be here next week, but advocates are consistent. That's the difference. Activists get really loud for a little bit, and then you never hear from them again. The advocates join commissions. The advocates are at the meetings, and they're actually saying, have you thought about this? Have you thought about preservation? You know, like, what if we repurpose the building? And just having that voice at the table has prevented terrible things from happening already, where people don't even realize how close some buildings can come to being demolished, and people don't even know what's going on with it. When it comes to relationships, um, you got to build your own, uh, because I heard all kinds of things about the villains of Saginaw, like I had mentioned. Now all of those people are like, I mean, essentially my colleagues, because in this work, um, you can't fight the inspections department. You know, like th that should be your best ally. We're talking about code enforcement. We're talking about maintaining buildings before they fall into the street. And, the, and with the land bank too, like we can't make enemies with the land bank because they hold over 5,000 properties in the city of Saginaw. They're a, they're a stakeholder, you know? Like, like they're not just gonna be run out of town because you're mad about something. And so I made this little meme about uh, what it ends up being because 90% of the time the villain is funding where it's, yeah, we'd love to do preservation stuff, but where's the money come from? You know, and we have money to tear stuff down. We've had multiple rounds in the 2000s where three times we had a giant influx of tens of millions of dollars 
specifically earmarked for demolition, to get rid of blighted structures. Imagine tens of millions of dollars going into roofing and masonry work or you know, window repair. That's just the perspective shift that I'd love to see in all of this. And then the last lesson is that the obstacles are your parameters. Because the things that are, that are oh, geez, that's not good, are actually all things that become really interesting uh, perks in the end. Because this house in public ownership on a main road with a bad roof, got to do it in six months, can't be residential, what do you do? And then on the other end, well, we gave it a public use. It's on a main road, so it's really easy to find. New roof, that's great. Uh, the blight was handled first. And because of the zoning, it's mixed use. You can do whatever you want with it. So that's a big perspective shift that I'm, I'm really trying to push around these parts because I'm, I'm seeing that preservation is, is a very novel thing where people think uh, that it's just kind of a fun, cute thing that we do because it's nice to keep the history. Um, the truth is, these are buildings that are already built. They exist. And uh, we, we, we say it's going to be all that money to, uh, you know, to fix that building up. It's going to be like, I mean, for this, they said it's going to be a million dollars. Oh my God, it's going to cost a million dollars. It cost $170,000 to do it. Wow. Can you build that house for $170,000? Wow. No. And on top of that, um, like you just think about that, like, like the inversion that happens when you just like try to think about it in a different way of these are buildings that we have. These are inheritances. Like, like this, this has been passed down for generations now. And it's a blank canvas for you to do whatever you need for now. And that was the brilliance of these historic structures, was that it wasn't about novelty. It wasn't a McDonald's getting plopped into the middle of a shopping mall. It was uh, a square, beautiful building that can be repurposed over and over and over and over. And you see that when you go through the old, or, uh, through the old directories that like, uh, they just come up with new ideas all the time for stuff. And just because it's vacant doesn't mean it can't be something else in the future. But when we think about things in a very suburban mentality, which is one use for that building, a KFC will only ever be a KFC. And if you don't believe me, there is a KFC on Genesee that they have turned into a cell phone shop, and the colonel's face is just a ghost. He's, he's, he's there. He's, the colonel's there, but it's a cell phone shop. <laughs> um, and, the, and then the last thing that I wanted uh, to leave you with, actually, is the coolest thing that's happening right now. Um, these lion heads have been a topic. Uh, everyone asks me about these. And this is actually, uh, a lot of people call it the lion house because of the lion heads out front. A lot of people remember this as the key feature um, that they remember the most about the house. And it turns out that um, those were from this building. Uh, so this is the old Saginaw News. This is on Washington. And if you look along the top, they adorned the building with terracotta lion heads. Um, and Rosemary was very, very, very against the demolition of this building because they had built a new Saginaw News building, which is now the SVRC Marketplace, which the adaptive reuse, a news building becomes a marketplace. When they were going to tear this down, Rosemary was furious about it. She fought it. Um, but what ended up happening was they tore the building down. And so she had her kids um, go into the rubble and pull out these four lion heads. And she fixed them on the front of her house so the people who worked at the Saginaw News would have to drive by her house every day oh. and see what they did. <laughs> and, and so these are now at the museum. And, uh, and I contacted the museum and I said, can we possibly have them back? And they laughed at me, literally laughed. And I was like, well, you didn't have to laugh, but like, that's fair. But what I wasn't considering is that these are artifacts. These are actually you know, pieces of an older building. And so if you look at the details of them, you know, there's cracks and things. And you think about water getting in and freezing. And they're just going to get worse. They're just going to break more over time. So what we ended up doing, um, we had an event last month or two months ago at the house. One of the people who came as a vendor, he's a metal worker. He has good friends who run a foundry. And they just got a brand new 3D scanning system and a 3D printer system. And so one of the things that they did about uh, two weeks ago, or a week or two ago, um, they came to the castle and they scanned uh, the heads. And they made a full 3D rendering of these. Um, and because of how they're all, I mean, if you notice, they're all broken in different ways. Well, if you, if you scan certain parts of certain ones, you can actually compile an entire model that's completed. 
and, and is you know, essentially perfect. And this is what they would have essentially cast. <laughs> so what they're doing right now, in fact, uh, I was told that it was going to be wrapped up this morning. Um, they've, been th they've been 3D printing the first model of this. Um, and they're doing it out of uh, carbon fiber. And it's taken five days to just print this one lion head. From there, they're going to make um, a mold out of rubber. And then from there, they're going to cast four more of these. And then they're going to glaze them. And then we're going to put them back on the house. <laughs> so we're going to have exact replicas of the lion heads that everybody knew. Um, but we can actually keep the historic integrity of the building, of um, the artifacts going to the Castle Museum and being protected, while you know most people won't even know that there's a difference because of how incredible this technology is. So that's, I mean, that's something that just, I, I, like I scratch my head every time I think about it because it's just amazing that this is where technology is. But I'm a huge advocate for the idea that uh, we may not have craftsmanship in terms of uh, these types of things don't happen all the time. You don't have legions of people who can just you know, carve out a lion head. Um, but what we don't have in craftsmanship, we have in technology now. And we can do amazing things um, that people can draw on computers. And you could print uh, things that would make interesting buildings again. And um, I'm just excited to see where this kind of technology goes. And they're doing this completely pro bono. Um, they're doing it because they think it's a cool project. And they got a new printer that they want to try out. Um, so it's really cool. Um, and actually, that company is called Aztec Inc. Uh, they're over in Vassar. And I got to visit them and watch the actual printing process. Um, and just the best people. So we're super excited about that process. Um, which brings us to the conclusion here, which is um, we are currently in the process of refinancing, but also fundraising, and doing all kinds of stuff. Um, we, we're really doing this on a shoestring to the point where um, you go to the store and, and you know, a gallon of high-grade polyurethane is about $150. Um, and those types of things, like we exhausted all of the funds to do where we are today, and now to, the, you know, to complete it, it's like 80, 90% there. It's, it's right on that edge, but there's small stuff we got to do uh, that's going to cost money. So if you are at all interested in contributing, we actually have an, um, an account through the Saginaw Community Foundation. Uh, so you can get a receipt if you need it. We're also on Venmo. Uh, but all of these things, if you need to contact me, that's my email. If you want to learn more about the house, that's the website. And then all the social media stuff as well. But uh, that's my long-winded pitch. So thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs>
it's gaining traction and as this wraps up, in fact, I was at the Green Black Building this morning before this for a cleanup and uh, great headway. <laughs> yeah. um, so I believe they're gonna be casting concrete in the end. Um, these were glazed actually with, um, the whole building was terracotta. And I don't know, I don't know enough about terracotta for that, but I know that there's a lot of um, play within the clay world, essentially, where they can do a glaze on it. Um, but we can basically make these out of anything, I guess, as long as they can <laughs> mount up front. And your windows, did you replace, repair? We repaired all of them. Yeah, um, I'm a huge advocate for keep your old windows because uh, they, they make up the, um, what the house is supposed to look like. And there's all kinds of houses around town now that look just weird because of the way that they've tried to accommodate for sl uh, small vinyl windows. But yeah. When, when was somebody actually resigning in We think around 2005, around there. We actually can't get a clear answer from anybody on that. Um, there was kind of a, a stretched out period where they knew that Rosemary had to be moved out of the house. She was living there by herself as she was pushing 90, I believe. Um, and there, there were just all kinds of instances that, I mean, I've heard stories from the inspections department about the calls that they would get, you know, and you hear about that kind of stuff. And then you think about that timeline of like the kids trying to figure out what to do with mom. And um, it, it, it ultimately ended up being that her daughter who lived in uh, Jersey, uh, she took her, or she took um, Rosemary home with her to, um, I forget where in New Jersey, but she was in New Jersey, um, and that was up until her death. But there's a time frame of just a big question mark of who's living there, was it vacant, uh, is it for sale, and there's just all, from 2004 to 2007 is my, <laughs> is the window that I work on. But it was vacant for like 12 years or something. About that, yeah. Yeah, because it was uh, 2018 we started. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, where, where did you find all of these people, the artisans and the workers that you had to do all of this stuff? Were they local? Did they come from out of state? We have had such an interesting collection of people who show up and just have a skill. Um, wow. This morning, actually, um, we, we had a guy uh, like on my way out as I was leaving the building, I was told that there was a guy who came by who is apparently, uh, he's an apprentice plumber um, and he does electrical work and he'd be willing to do the work on our building for free. Um, and like th those kinds of relationships, you know. Um, when you make it not your house, this is the tricky thing that, I, oop, this is the tricky thing that I've realized, is that there's a line between helping someone with their house and then having a community project. I get asked all the time when I'm moving in. <laughs> like people think that this is my this is my big flip, you know, and I'm gonna live there. Um, and then I get to explain, like, no, everyone, like, it's for everybody, <laughs> you know. But um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's hard to find people though. Like, do they get credit? You know. Oh yeah. The, um, so on uh, the people who have made the larger donations, we've got whole rooms named after them, um, and then there are also. Uh, the companies that have donated things, they've also got, uh, the flooring was all donated by A.T. Frank that we needed. Um, and so there's just, an, really just asking around. And I'm involved in a number of community organizations. One of them, uh, I mean, they raise $18,000 a year, you know, to put on a film festival um, by just asking small businesses, just, hey, can you, you know, uh, can you throw in 400? Um, and that accumulates up. But the, the big thing that we're trying to do here as well is that um, in the Green Block area, there's actually an organization that just, they just dropped anchor in the neighborhood. And uh, would you believe it that uh, it's a program that teaches people skilled trades? Um, and it's a way to get your GED or, um, or to go uh, like into a different trade or something like that. So the, uh, the kids are all paid by the federal government already. Um, and we've been talking about a partnership for um, them doing the construction work in this area because then your costs go super down which allows your rents to be super down which makes it very accessible um, and the what we're seeing in Old Town too that, that there's a model that if you pay attention and and this is what the documentary really focused on was that there are young people who are starting new businesses in old buildings and that's happening everywhere they're out of buildings to develop in Old Town now the developers are actually saying there are no more buildings so it's either gonna be new construction or they move downtown the problem with going downtown is they tore down too many buildings. Mm -hmm. And so we're in this paradox now of like, well, we, we have this destroyed infrastructure that is in dire, like it's a D minus grade for the condition that it's in. 
But that being said, it's an intact block. You know, like you have enough to work with where you could have a small little district there. And the, with the way that you see things happen in places like Detroit, um, it, it, it was happening all the time in Denver, and it just baffled me of like, you're putting what there? Like th that, you're gonna do like a bar in an old industrial site, and it's just yeah, they're just gonna. I'm just going to put that there. So, so we're, we're running out of places to put things, um, yet we have a vacancy crisis. But there's, there's just this big catch-22 in all of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what do you think the outcome would be for the community if preservation isn't made a priority? Hmm. Um, that's a great question, actually, because that's uh, I got to be careful with that because I rant at my friends until like two in the morning about this stuff. Um, really, I think the problem is that places just become less interesting. Um, you can drop, I mean, you can drop someone like right on Titabawasi, you know, right around the Target area, and say, "Where are you?" And you could be anywhere in America. Um, it's kind of the the like. Literally everything's been homogenized, and when everything is a chain, and it's so funny because I remember when uh, growing up, people saying Walmart's are going to kill mom and pops, and now there's no more mom and pops. You know, like it, they they were right, and so th there there seems to be this. Um, it's kind of, uh, I think they call it the new urbanism of um, working with these places because the suburbs were built on the homogenized, you know, like the like the malls and the chains and all of those things. The inner city was, you know. These types of buildings, <laughs> like like things that were really interesting. Uh, so the character of of the town is directly reflected in the architecture. And um, and I'm the chair of the historic district commission, and I spend a lot of time, you know, thinking about how you have to be able to identify these things, but how people don't even know what the benefit is, because it's something that you don't realize until it's not there. Um, and I joke all the time that it's kind of odd that in my careers, I work as an editor, and I was an AV tech for a while, and I was a projectionist. And I keep finding these roles where you only know I exist if I mess up. <laughs> so um, like if you go to a conference, no one ever says, oh man, the microphone didn't feed back once. You know, it's like those kinds of things. Where with preservation work, suddenly you lose something, and everyone goes, ah. And, and it's, you know. Sometimes it's progress. You know, sometimes it's being replaced with something. But oftentimes, it's, uh, if we clear the land, they will come. Uh, that kind of perspective that left us with a lot of parking lots. <laughs> so I would like to have a community that's not lined with parking lots. And the other thing about this, too, is we love to talk about things like, um, or like a town being walkable. And the funny thing is, these towns were built before cars existed. So if you want to figure out peak walkability, Think about a town where you can't have a car and what it means to get groceries in a town where you don't have a car, but the nearest grocery store is in a different, it's two zip codes away. <laughs> so you have to drive 15 minutes on a highway to get to groceries. So like you think about the kinds of, uh, I mean, it's really about using what you have because this kind of stuff is, is just, um, it's one of a kind. It, like, like you had people a long time ago who were doing amazing things, and the architects we had here were like first class. Um, and I think it's or that we do a disservice to uh, that talent that we had by just leveling their work. You know, it's basically like if you went into an art gallery and just started snapping all the paintings over your knee and just saying like, "Yeah, I thought it was an eyesore." <laughs> like it's yeah, it wasn't to other people. <laughs> Is the leopard by any chance buried in the backyard? I'm pretty sure he is, actually. <laughs> um, I think I, I'm pretty sure my friend did it, too. Like, he was the one who, like, he helped her with the burial. Um, I think he died in the early 2000s or the 90s. But yeah, he's, he's in there. And, and also, she had a lot of other pets, too. So, like, yeah. what I've been told is that there's a lot of cats and there's a lot of, uh, there's, I've heard Black Panther. I've heard monkeys. I've heard all kinds of stuff that she had in the house, but <laughs> who knows if it's in the yard now. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's because the, you, you start wondering what's urban legend at a certain point. You know, like you, you hear people come in and it's like the fish that keeps getting bigger. Like it's, uh, yeah, like uh, I've had people say that she walked lions down the road and I'm like, are you mistaking the lion heads with a leopard? And, but, 
But when it comes to a Black Panther, you can't mistake a leopard for a Black Panther. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's something that I've heard it enough times that I think that that's true. I was surprised when you said leopard because I was sure I'd seen yeah. a panther. Yeah, it, it was probably one of everything. <laughs> uh, she had friends in the circus, and that's how she got that's how she got the leopard to begin with. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were if there were other you know other friends. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Come up forward, and make a compliment. <clears throat> I want to compliment this young man. I remember it was probably eight years ago. Now he came up to the lighthouse with his dad. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were running up and down the tower and yeah. taking these, your dad was, and taking different shots. Um, to come back to the local area since then, it's got to be eight, ten years ago you came out, mm -hmm. as time flies, and to take on the responsibility and have the vision and figure out how to do it. And I encourage everybody else, regardless of how young or old you are, lean into it. Talk to your neighbors or friends and get involved in these kind of projects. <clears throat> we as the Saginaw River Marine Historical Society got involved with Dow 22 <coughs> years ago. And if we'd have had a crystal ball, you don't want a crystal ball on these. You wouldn't have done it. You'd say, well, yep. okay, this is a three to five year project. It's been 22 years. It's, the lighthouse is going to happen, built about the same time as the Lee Mansion in 1870s, 1880s, that time period of what was going on. But because some people here in the community got involved, got their foot in the door, the structure's still there, and now it's going to be renovated. Mm -hmm. And a year from next June, it'll be open with a public road for the public to go to the White House. And a major amount of funding, dollars going to take care of it. In fact, now we increased the budget by 50%. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So there's good things happening, and you got to network and uh, have the right approach. Compliments. Well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the. the uh, or there's one thing that you had said that's extremely true. If you have a crystal ball, like if you would have told me I'd be in this for three years, uh, I probably wouldn't have done it. And it's kind of a blessing that you don't know because it's just the next thing to do, you know? And, uh, and I actually thought that the moment that Alex got involved with the project that I was gonna be out, but he literally gave me a hammer one day of like, if you're gonna complain about this stuff, you're, you're, doing it. You're, you're, you're gonna do this. And then it was a matter of, you know, the, like the investment that he made, I wanted, to, I wanted to show him it was worth it too. So it's just, you just keep, yeah, you just keep doing that kind of stuff. And we do need more people in the trenches. And uh, YouTube has been, one of the best friends I've ever had because of, I, I've learned plumbing, electrical, drywall, uh, like name it, there's a YouTube video out there of someone who's explaining it to you. So yeah, it's, it's a really, it, it, the whole field is just a lot of fun. And, and the, like the stretch of, it can be lighthouses, it can be houses, it can be ships. There's all kinds of stuff that um, need this kind of love and attention. And it's the kind of stuff that isn't really profitable, so people overlook it. Uh, but it's the kind of stuff that means more here than it does uh, in the wallet. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I think you had, I think you had oh, one too. I was just gonna speak to you before I'm done. Just, you know, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for your pers er, perseverance. Um, and I also was gonna suggest before the lions came up in this uh, portion that uh, on the front, Porch, you should have the two the recast of the uh, cheetah up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, there was in the auction that had a bunch of like hardware and stuff that belonged to the house. That's a whole other story. Um, it's really hard to fit everything into an hour because it is three years of just crazy things happening. But there was a ceramic leopard that was like three feet tall, and I, I don't know what happened, but I was trying to outbid the current person, and it wouldn't take my bid, and then it expired, and I was just like, I was gonna. So we were gonna have a ceramic leopard, but we don't know. <laughs> is your documentary on your social, on your Vimeo? Um, the, the trailer and everything is on uh, the Vimeo. Um, the documentary is actually gonna be re-released later this year. Um, I'm revisiting the entire thing because uh, really the, the house, I just got really carried away <laughs> with, with other stuff. I got a little distracted. Um, but there's more of, uh, 
it was a lot more of a message. Like I said earlier, I, I wasn't sure about the, um, the tone or like, you know, the direction that it was going in. Um, but these days, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm advocating for this stuff every day these days. Uh, so it's like the, the movie is basically going to be a thesis statement for the things that I think are, are the, the fixes in Saginaw, which is just um, one of the guys, he's, or like he puts it perfectly. He says, if you look at Saginaw and you say, how do I fit? You're like, oh my god, how do I fix this thing? He's, you can't. <laughs> but you can make really small bites. And it's going to be incremental change that's going to matter. And, and that's, you know, one person does something, another person does something, another person does something. Um, and that's the theme of the movie, is just people who just take it upon themselves to just do stuff. And like incrementally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if we can't have a parks department, you know, we're going to have to have volunteers go clean up a park. Like, that's the kind of stuff that happens around town all the time. And uh, the news actually, uh, like, I remember my dad telling me that he quit the news because he was really tired of interviewing people on the worst day of their life. Um, and, like, the ambulance chasing and, you know, all of that. Um, it's a very different story when you look for... <laughs> Like when you look for that kind of stuff, like if it bleeds, it leads. But you know, if it's heartfelt, ah, put it on page four. <laughs> so it's it's uh, yeah, it's 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 essentially a testament to that. But I just the moment I got done with it, I realized I didn't know what I was trying to say. And so yeah, that's going to be coming out um, probably in the fall. I would say I just got to finish the house first. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's it. Thank you again, everybody. I appreciate it so much.